okay so hi everyone today's class is going to be on tuberous sclerosis so tuberous sclerosis comes under a group of disorders known as neurocutaneous syndromes so i'll be discussing the other neurocutaneous syndromes and also the notes for this class on neuraxis pro i have put the link in the description so you can go ahead and access my material over there okay now let's go into the class so remember the other name for tuberous sclerosis is bone wills disease it is bone wills disease this is an important mcq question okay so tuberous sclerosis is a neurocutaneous syndrome that predominantly affects the brain skin kidneys heart also the retina and very importantly in female patients predominantly the lungs and the clinical features here are mainly because of hamartomas rather than tumors it's mostly because of hamartomas but you can also have neoplasms in tuberous sclerosis that occur in the kidney in the form of angiomyolipomas in the form of angiomyolipomas and in the brain as subependymal giant cell astrocytomas all right now come into the epidemiology so it occurs in one in every 6000 to 9000 population and in infants the clinical features are going to be predominantly cardiac features with seizures and in older patients it's going to be predominantly cutaneous manifestations with lung involvement and renal involvement now coming to the genetics so like your other neurocutaneous syndromes the inheritance here is going to be autosomal dominant with variable penetrance and the two important genes that you have to remember is TSC1 which is present on chromosome 9 that codes for hamartil and then we have tsc2 that is present on chromosome 16 that codes for tuberin remember among these two genes your tsc2 is going to be the most commonly mutated it codes for tuberin it's the most commonly mutated and it's the one that has a more severe clinical course so both these genes are very important for the exam and also another important point you should remember is 10 to 25 percentage of the patients will have a normal genetic testing so a normal genetic test does not rule out tuberous sclerosis especially in ca in cases where the clinical suspicion is high you don't rule out tuberous sclerosis just based on the genetic testing next so first we'll discuss the cutaneous manifestations the most important the most earliest one to arrive and the most common one is going to be your hypomelanotic macules or your ash leaf macules so remember that ash leaf macules are actually seen in 5% of the normal population so to say that it is significant or diagnostic of tuberous sclerosis there should be at least 3 or more ash leaf macules and each should be at least 5 mm in diameter it is very common it is seen in 90 to 95% of tuberous sclerosis patients and it can be picked up very early it's one of the earliest cutaneous manifestations of tuberous sclerosis it can be even picked up in the neonatal period but to see it at that point of time you might have to visualize it under the uv light so this is the ash leaf macule that is a hypomelanotic macule okay next we have your facial angiofibromas and adenoma sebaceum so these are cutaneous lesions that consist of vascular as well as connective tissue elements again they are common seen in 75% of the patients but unlike your ash leaf macules they do not present from birth they usually appear only after several years and very important it is one of the manifestations of tuberous sclerosis that is going to respond to your mTOR inhibitors that is rapamycin so what are the other clinical features of tuberous sclerosis that respond to rapamycin so your subependymal giant cell astrocytoma pulmonary lymph angio leiomyomatosis lymphangio myomatosis then of course your facial angiofibromas as we discussed right now and your renal angio myolipoma renal angio myolipoma so these are the clinical features of tuberous sclerosis that are going to respond well to your mTOR inhibitors like rapamycin and everolimus and also you can use laser therapy laser therapy also can be used for adenoma sebaceum so this is the adenoma sebaceum so you can see it has both vascular and connective tissue elements this is a classical adenoma sebaceum okay next we have the shagreen patch 
So shagreen patch is less common than your adenoma sebaceum and your ash leaf macules and they are seen only in 48% of the patients. They are characteri uh, characteristically present over the back or the flank and it is characterized by an irregular raised or textured skin. So this is your shagreen patch which is an irregular raised patch. Okay. Now coming to your ungual fibromas. So these can either be periungual or subungual and they are classically nodular or fleshy in appearance and they are much less common com compared to your other cutaneous manifestations. They are seen only in 15 to 20 percent of patients and they are seen in adulthood. So remember the cutaneous manifestation that is going to present very early is going to be your ash leaf macules. Your other cutaneous manifestations tend to present little later on. So this is your ungual fibromas. You can see the jungle fibromas over here. Okay, and then we have your confetti lesions. So these are nothing but stippled hypopigmented lesions present in the extremities. An important point that you should remember here is confetti lesion is actually a minor diagnostic criteria. So if you take your ash leaf macule, your adenoma sebaceum, your uh, ungual fibromas, all of them come under major diagnostic criteria. Whereas the cutaneous manifestation which comes under a minor diagnostic criteria is going to be your confetti lesions. So you can look over here, your ash leaf macules, your angiofibromas, ungual fibromas, chagrin patch, all of these cutaneous manifestations are major diagnostic criteria. But if you take the confetti lesions, it is a cutaneous manifestation which is a minor diagnostic criteria. This is an important MCQ. Okay, now coming to the neurological features, very important. So, subependymal nodules. So, subependymal nodules usually appear near the foramen of Munro and they have a very high tendency to calcify. So, hence they are best seen with CT brain and some of them may transform into subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. Remember, subependymal giant cell astrocytoma will respond to your mTOR inhibitors, that is rapamycin. And sometimes you can have multiple subependymal nodules along the ventricular surface. So, this is known as candle guttering. This is a very, very important MCQ question. So, this is a very important picture MCQ. So, this is a subependymal giant cell astroma. Subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. Very, very important picture MCQ. So, next is your cortical or subcortical tubers or hamartomas. So, these are linear or wedge shaped lesions that extend from the ventricular wall to the cortical surface and they develop usually between 14 to 16 weeks of gestation. An important question over here, they are best visualized with T2 weighted MRI. Next, you have your fo focal cortical dysplasia. This is because of dysmorphic neurons or other abnormal astrocytes. The MCQ point that you have to remember here is they have a balloon or giant cells. Okay, there will be balloon or giant cells over here. And very, very important, seizures. Seizures are very common in tuberous sclerosis. They can present as multiple types. They are seen in 80 to 90 percent of the patients. And very, very important, infantile spasms are seen in one third of all tuberous sclerosis patients. So remember, the most common cause of infantile spasms is tuberous sclerosis. Very, very important MCQ. The most common cause of infantile spasms is tuberous sclerosis and one third of tuberous sclerosis patients are going to present with infantile spasms. So I think you might have learnt earlier that the drug of choice for infantile spasms is actually ACTH. But in case the patient is having infantile spasms in the scenario of a tuberous sclerosis patient, that time the drug of choice is going to be Vigabatrin. So this concept is a very, very important MCQ. So if you take infantile spasms overall, the drug of choice is ACTH. But infantile spasms in tuberous sclerosis, the drug of choice is going to be Vigabatrin. And for refractory cases, you can try corpus callosotomy. You can try corpus callosotomy. Next, yes, patients are going to have intellectual disability. Psychiatric issues are also very common. And the MCQ point that you should remember here is autism. 25 to 50 percent of the patients of tuberous sclerosis was going, are going to have autistic spectrum disorder. Other issues can be behavioral disorders, aggressiveness, psychosis, and mood disorders. Next, coming to the retinal features. So your retinal hamartomas. Usually they don't cause major visual issues. Just remember, they are described as mulberry lesions. Next, coming to your cardiac rhabdomyoma. So this is a hamartoma, not a, tu not a tumor, it's rather a hamartoma which is present in the heart in two-thirds of patients of tuberous sclerosis. They tend to be multiple and they generally involute over time and most of the time they are asymptomatic. The complications which it can cause is cardiac arrhythmias, cerebral thromboembolism and heart failure. Next, coming to your renal features. So renal angiomyolipomas. 
So renal angiomyelomyelipoma is the important renal tumor that occurs in tuberous sclerosis. It's seen in three fourth of all patients. It usually presents by ten years of age. It is commonly multiple and bilateral. And again, it is one of the clinical features or manifestations of tuberous sclerosis that is going to respond to your mTOR inhibitors. It responds well to your mTOR inhibitors. Other treatment can be endovascular embolization for larger tumors. Other things are renal cysts. Uh, renal cell carcinoma is actually not increased greatly in tuberous sclerosis, but in case it does happen, it tends to have an early onset. Next, coming to the pulmonary manifestation, very, very important uh, manifestation that is seen in female patients who have tuberous sclerosis, that is pulmonary lymphangioleomyomatosis. Very, very important. So, it usually presents after puberty and it is very common in female patients. 5 is to 1 ratio. 50% of female tuberous sclerosis patients are going to have lymphangioleomyomatosis as seen in CT chest. The clinical features can be spontaneous or recurrent pneumothorax, dyspnea, cough, hemoptysis and remember this is the other clinical manifestation that is responsive to mTOR inhibitors. Other drugs that you can use are tamoxifen and progesterone and remember that 10 to 12 percentage of the patients are going to die within 10 years of the onset of symptoms due to this disease. So this is a CT chest picture of pulmonary lymphangioleomyomatosis. It's an important picture MCQ. So they can give a clinical scenario of tuberous sclerosis and then give the CT, uh, CT chest picture. So it is an important picture MCQ. Uh, I think I covered most of the important points. Thank you.